The uh, theme verse for our series right now is to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And the fact is, is that we look at this, and this a, we'll do this another portion of it next Sunday as well, even though uh, that's after Thanksgiving, uh, and we're getting ready for Christmas. I know all of you have your trees up, right? Yeah. All got your presents all bought? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to still do. I can't believe Christmas is coming already. (laughs) Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you in Christ Jesus. But the fact is that that not all circumstances are good. Not all circumstances are enjoyable. Some are extremely painful, sorrowful. Uh, They break us, and, and so it's a tough thing. In fact, Paul, even as he's sharing this, he's experiencing the difficulties of, of being persecuted, prison, and eventual death. And, and, he's, and he's learning how, how does he give thanks? And he's challenging us to do that, regardless of our circumstances is really the rule. Because thanksgiving should not be about our circumstances. Thanksgiving, our thanks to God, is about who God is. In fact, in our darkest moments, we'll talk about this in a few moments, in our darkest moments, God's there. And we give thanks simply because of that. We may, we may be in pain, we may be uh, facing surgery, we may be going through a divorce, we may be just broken, we may be lonely, depressed, discouraged, afraid, grieving, and, and, and in all those situations, we're not thanking God for that bad feeling or the hurt that we're going through, but we're thanking God in the midst of it because God is there with us, because God cares about us. So the first verse of Psalm 9, one we'll be looking at Psalm 9 today, is for the director of the music to the tune of the death of the son. A Psalm of David, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. There is a variety of opinion on what's this Psalm about. Notice that the tune is the death of the son. The death of the son. And, and in this case, it says we're even supposed to give thanks at the death of a son? David experienced that more than once, didn't he? Some say that this is all about when Absalom died. Do you remember who Absalom is? Actually, the third son, right? Third son, Solomon before him, and then a baby boy before that. And in 2 Samuel 18, 33, it says the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. If only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. What has happened? Well, if you back up in the story, Absalom did not like the fact that David was king and actually took over the throne. And he did that by waiting at the city gates and meeting people who were coming there to have issues to be dealt with. And he would say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of that. Or he'd say, you know, if I was king, I would treat you differently. And he did that so much that within a few years, so many people were supportive of him being the king that when he declared himself as king, the nation joined in behind him. Ten tribes of Israel all supported him. And so David, because he doesn't want to either fight his own son or he and his leaders to be killed, but they actually flee Jerusalem. And as they head out of Jerusalem, they're cursed by some of the people. Later, a man who who will actually rail against him will then have to come back and apologize when David comes back. Because they then eventually fight, the soldiers will fight one another, and God will give Absalom and his armies back to David and the throne back to David. And Joab, David's general, and incidentally, David has issued this decree. He says, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to fight Absalom and his soldiers, but please do not harm my son, Absalom. He loves his son. Joab sees uh, Absalom. Absalom has been riding on a donkey and he's been moving away from the battle scene and he gets caught in a branch and, it, and the donkey goes on, and he's hanging there from this branch in a tree. And Joab finds that out, 
and Joab's the general, and Joab just says, I'm getting rid of Absalom. I'm not gonna allow this man to live. I don't care what David said. And Joab will take 10 young men, surround Absalom, and they'll kill him. And they'll put him in a pile of dirt and put rocks on top of him. And then they send messengers to David to say that we've won the battle. But they also need to bring the news that your son is dead. David, at verse 33, has just gotten the news that his son Absalom is dead. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Joab comes then and arrives and says, you know, we're supposed to be celebrating And Job went into the house of the king and said, Today you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that come on, have come on you from your youth till now. And what is he forcing him to do? He's forcing David to go out and praise the troops and celebrate their victory while he's grieving the death of his son to encourage these men who have fought on his behalf to give him the throne back. And at the same time, it's one of those two-edged swords. Yes, I'm glad to be back in Jerusalem and back on the throne, but my son, my son, Absalom. The other possibility is that this is about the story of Bathsheba's firstborn son to David the one born out of wedlock, the one born to Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, because of the sin of David. And Nathan, you might remember, comes to David and points out to him, you've sinned, you've committed sin by stealing something terrible. Uriah, and, or, or excuse me, David saw Bathsheba bathing, invites her to the palace, they become intimate, she gets pregnant, and and now they've got to try to cover the fact that she's got to, going to have a baby. So he brings Uriah the Hittite back from the battlefield. Back from the battlefield. Uriah is a man of God, of God, a man that honors his king and honors the Lord. And so Uriah comes and he comes to the palace. And, and David says, okay, you go home, spend the night with your wife. Um, and, and Uriah says, no way. I'm staying right here at the palace because, in fact, I'm going to sleep outside on the ground because I should not be someplace where it's nice when, your sol- when my soldiers are out there fighting to save our, the kingdom, David. So, no, I'm going to stay right here on, on the ground. So the next night, David finds that out. Oh, great. Okay, that didn't work. So he gets him drunk, as drunk as he can. He figures, that'll work. I, you know, now I'll send him home to his, his wife and because and, uh, I just got to get them together. And even if he doesn't remember, and, and Uriah again, he st- even as drunk as he is, he says, nope, nope, I, I got to stay here. And he sleeps that night there again outside. So the next day, David says, okay, this is not going to work. I, I, I can't get them to be intimate. So he comes up with another plan and he writes a letter and he hands it to Uriah and he says, take this letter to, your, to the general on the, on the battlefield. In the letter are the instructions for the general so that he is supposed to, to Joab, he says, Joab says, okay, you are supposed to put Uriah out at the front of the battle lines at the fiercest part of the battle and then you tell the rest of your soldiers to back up which will cause Uriah to be killed. Uriah is carrying his death sentence with him and still a man of honor, he does what the king asks of him. Nathan learns of all this because God reveals it to him and confronts David and David has to confess his sin. And then Uriah tells him, because of doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. David, I'm in 2 Samuel 12, by the way, in a couple of different verses. Verse 16, David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. Instead, David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. 
Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting like this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. David knows that this child is dying because of his sin. That a son of his is going to die because of his sin. David understands that and so he's praying, God, please be gracious. I know I don't deserve this, so this is something asking, something extra. Please be gracious and and save my son. Don't allow him to die. And he's fasting and praying that way, and and so much so that the attendants are concerned about him. But notice what happens. When the baby dies and he learns of that, instead of getting upset at the men, what does he do? He gets up, he goes to his room, he washes himself, he purifies himself, and he goes from there and goes in and worships the Lord because he understands that in the midst of his grief, God is with him. And notice what he goes on to say. I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? No, he's dead. I can't bring him back from the dead, but I will go to him, but he will not return to me. What does David understand? I know that one day I'm going to see him again. He can't come back from the other side, but I can go from here to to heaven and be with him again. And so I don't need to fast and pray anymore. Instead, I need to worship the God who's going to reunite us someday, the God who's going to bring us back together, the God who's going to allow me to hold him and love him and hug him and just be there with him. That's the God I need to worship, and, and that's what moves him to give thanks even in the midst of the death of a son. See, David, David believes it, doesn't he? David believes he's going to see this baby again, and we don't even know the name of the baby. Nowhere in Scripture do we have a name for this, for this little baby. But David believes he's going to see this little child again. He's going to go to him. He has faith in God and in eternal life, and he believes, and because of that, he will praise God. Isn't that what praise is about, by the way? When I'm praising God... I'm not saying, oh, wow, everything's cheery and happy and wonderful. When I'm praising God, I'm saying, God, I trust you. God, I believe in you. God, I may not like the circumstances I'm facing. I may not like what I'm going through, but I know, God, that you're here with me and you're at work in my life. And I believe, and so David gets up and he says, I believe that you're God. I believe in everlasting life. I believe we're going to get together again. And so he gets up and he goes and he worships. Now, I'm sure there was still pain in his heart, but there's a sense of I can praise and worship God because I believe in God. Folks, praise is not about having a happy feeling. Our praise is about our confidence in a God who loves us. Our praise is about us being able to trust what that God says to us, our believing who he is. And think about this for a minute. If I don't believe in God, and and I don't believe there is a God, will I praise God? (laughs) Of course not. I I won't praise him, and and I won't praise him for the beautiful sky this morning or the the sunrise that was out there. I won't praise him for the fresh air. I won't praise him for the blue, for the, for the, the green trees. I won't praise him for the people around me. I won't praise him and thank him for the things that I've received, for the good things happening in my life. I won't thank him for any of that because he doesn't exist in my mind. If I don't believe in God, I'm never going to give thanks like that, am I? But it's because I believe in God. I will not allow my circumstances to rule over me, but rather I will allow God to rule me in my circumstances. Dr. Ray Pritchard says there's 38 ways to give thanks in hard times. If you're going through a hard time, see if you can do one of these. We give thanks that God is sovereign. He's greater than everything around us. That nothing happens by chance. We're not a chance. We're here because God designed us. That God causes all things to work together for good for his children. Doesn't say everything is good, does it? 
And every, probably most of us here have experienced some bad, some pain, some grief, some loss. The, the, those things aren't all good, but God, that God works good out of all of those things. That hard times reveal our weakness, break our pride, and show us our total need for God. When I'm going through something rough, I start realizing how much more I need God. We give thanks that God has triumphed over sin and death through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what your circumstances, are you a sinner? Have you ma- messed up? You can give thanks that God has defeated the sin and, and saved you through Jesus Christ. We give thanks that God uses the worst that happens to promote our spiritual growth. My suffering, my persecu- any persecution you're going through, any difficulty, God wants to use that to help you grow and to become more like him. We give thanks that God is faithful even when we are faithless. <laughs> Any of you messed up really bad and kind of turned on God? And, and we, can, we give thanks because he's still faithful. We give thanks that God's word will be vindicated. What he says in this word is true, and we can trust it. We give thanks that evil will not reign forever. That's why God has not come back yet. That's why evil has not been destroyed yet. But there is a day coming when all evil will be destroyed. And we give thanks that it will not reign forever. We give thanks that heaven is real, that there's a place on the other side, that if we know Jesus, that he's the way, the truth, and life, and we can get to go there and see people that have died here that we love and care about. We believe that and we we celebrate that fact that heaven is real. We give thanks that this world is not the real world. We're just passing through this world. This world is a temporary world. It's only part time. This is not where you're going to stay. The body you're in is not the one you're going to stay in. We're getting to go to a new one and a new place and it's much better than this. We give thanks when we are weak because he is strong. We give thanks that his grace is sufficient for every situation. No matter what I'm facing, God has strength to be available to us. We give thanks that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That our salvation rests on God, not on us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. That God reaches into the lowest of hells, the worst of places, and communicates his love. We give thanks that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every one of our sins. We give thanks that God delights to save sinners that the Lord can soften the hardest heart, and that includes mine, that there, is no, there are no impossible cases for God, that even when we feel alone, we are never alone. We give thanks that our Father will not test us beyond what we can bear, but that he'll provide a way out of that temptation. We give thanks that the Holy Spirit abides with us always. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ feels our pain That the Holy Spirit, are you keeping track, by the way? Yes. I got it. it. 38, we're about two-thirds of the way through, maybe three-fifths. We give thanks that the Holy Spirit prays for us when we are too weak to pray for ourselves. The Holy Spirit does it, even with groanings too deep for words. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus intercedes for those of us who are finally saved. He is the one that steps in there on our behalf. He goes to the throne of God on our behalf. We give thanks that God uses everything and wastes nothing. Nothing is a waste to him. Nothing is unimportant or unvaluable. Wrong word, but you understand. We give thanks that, that God is... That, God, that our doubts cannot cancel God's work in us. That even when we doubt, God's still at work, keeping his promises, all of which are yes in Christ Jesus. We give thanks that someday we will be conformed to the image of Christ. We're not perfect, we're far from it, but someday we will be. We give thanks that our hardships equip us to minister to others. How many times have you gone through something painful and you've used that pain to minister to somebody else who's hurting as much or more than you? We give thanks that we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. God's invited us into his throne room. We, we get to speak to God face to face right there in his throne room. We give thanks that God's plan far exceeds our puny imagination. He's God, we're not. We think we are sometimes, but he is his ability to think and, and create and imagine is way beyond ours. We give thanks that weeping endures for a night, but what comes in the morning? Joy comes in the morning, even in the midst of the pain. We give thanks that we are still God's children even when our faith falters. Even when we get afraid, even when we're doubting and we're questioning, we give thanks that, his, that he is still there for us and that we are still his children. And that 
that while we suffer outwardly, we are being renewed inwardly. That while we're in pain, our bodies are wasting away. And uh, George, you and I were talking about trying to get up from back there. You're going to groan when you get up again? Yeah, that's the groaning bench back there. Both of us were groaning today as we were standing up. We give thanks that these bodies are wasting away, but we are being renewed inside. And finally, that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. God is at work, folks, and we have reason to give thanks. The psalmist says, David says this, he says, I will praise the Lord. I've got reason to praise the Lord. Even when I'm grieving, I've got reason to praise the Lord. Even though my son has just died, I have reason to praise the Lord. Be careful what you say to someone who is grieving, by the way, folks. Have you ever listened to what people say to somebody who's just lost a loved one? Oh, I just would warn you, say less. Maybe say nothing with words. Say it all with your eyes, with your arms, by your presence, and say it with your ears as you listen. And here's what I can tell you. Don't tell someone who just lost a son to praise the Lord. Someone just lost a loved one. Well, praise the Lord anyways. Give thanks to God. Shut up. Amen. No, instead of you telling them to do Invite them to share. Invite them to talk if they're ready to. And don't say, please tell me how they died. You know, go into all the details. You know, maybe they, didn't, maybe they don't want to talk about that at all. It's like the fireman that I was meeting with, and, we, and he had just had a little boy that had drowned, and he, said, and, and he was, like, angry. And, and, and it was messing him up. He could barely drive the engine. And when I got there, as called as the chaplain, he said, I'm not talking to you. That's okay, you don't need to. But two and a half hours later, I had spent an hour and a half with him talking. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this, this situation at all. I'm not going to talk about it at all. I don't want to say anything like that. That's okay. In fact, you don't even have to sit in on this little circle I'm meeting with the whole crew. It's okay, you don't need to. But later, when he was ready to talk, he talked. And by the way, the same, the same engineer became a captain and later had another drowning. And guess what he did before he even called dispatch for help after the, the, they decided this baby was dead? Guess what he did? He got out his cell phone and he called Chaplain Bill and he said, you gotta come to 29 Palms, Bill you got to come and help my crew now. We just had a drowning and a little boy. You see, you don't talk. Don't tell them stuff. Instead, invite them to talk, and eventually they'll start talking about their loved one. And guess what that is? Thanks. As they start to talk and share the memories, there's something that's going to come up that they're going to be giving thanks for. Let them talk. But the other thing you should do, weep with those who weep. And if you're not ready to weep, then you probably shouldn't go over to the house yet. <laughs> okay? But be quiet. And let people feel their pain. Because as they praise God for their loved one, as they start to just think about something that was special, as they start to share memories, what are they doing? Then, and what can you do? Then join them in the praise. Yeah, I thank God for what he did as well. Yes, he's special to me too. Listen, hug, cry. Let your words be, fruit, be few, your prayers many, and just be there for them. You see, memorials are for grieving, aren't they? They're for crying, but they're also for celebrating a person's life, and they're for us to reach out to God to minister to us. So let God work. Psalm 9 goes on. He says, For the director of music to the tune of the death of the Son, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. 
For you have, have upheld my right and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. What does Paul say? Give thanks in all circumstances. Praise God for how he's dealing with your enemy. Don't do it in, with half-hearted praise. Oh, yeah, thank you, God, for taking care of that. But sing about what God has done. God is defending you against your enemies. That's what the psalmist is saying. He's helping you in whatever battle you're facing. He's your defense. And he's saying, I'm with you. I'm taking care of you. And, but notice how he goes on. Incredible statement here in verse 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. God is a refuge. And that's why Psalmist is saying, I can praise God because God's carrying me right now. He's my strength. He's the one. Oh, low battery. <laughs> It'll probably last. It still says 10%, but see what this cord does to me. Don't worry, it won't stop me. I can't hold still. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord will be a refuge, the psalmist says. He's protecting me. He's taking care of me. In fact, think of this from Psalm 46. According to a, a song, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Though things get really, really bad, he's saying, the Lord's my refuge and my strength. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord Almighty has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I'm sure most of you have heard um, the, 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 the poem, Footprints in the Sand. Is that unfamiliar to anybody? Uh, by the way, there's still an argument about... Uh, I'll mention that briefly. There's still an argument about at least four, and now there are possibly 16 to 20 different people that say they all wrote the poem. <laughs> Who knows, really? Um, but the message of footprints in the, sun, in the sand, the man's walking on the beach, and, and he's... Uh, going through his life and sometimes there's two sets of footprints and sometimes there's one and, and the man notices that in the times that there's one set of footprints that those are his worst times, his most difficult times, his most painful times, most discouraging moments are then those moments when, he's, when there's just one set of footprints and he's kind of bothered by that because he looks to God and he says, God, why is it? And he's kind of upset now, a little bit ticked off if you want to be honest about it. Why is it that in my darkest, most difficult, most painful moments there's one set of footprints? Why did you leave me by myself? And God says, you're right. There's one set of footprints and it's the darkest moments of your life. But in those moments, those are not, because those are not your footprints. Those are the times that I was carrying you. Footprints in the sand. That's a, it's, it's similar to what the psalmist is trying to say here. God's our refuge. God's our strength. God is with us. In the midst of the worst of times, God's there. God's carrying us. We're not doing it alone. And we can celebrate that. God wants to carry us. There's something else that the psalmist brings out. Not only is it our refuge and strength, but look at verse 10. 
Not only am I with you, not only have I been carrying you, I'll be your protection in the midst of whatever you're facing, but look at verse 10. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Do you know God's name? Do you know God's name? It's interesting to do a search of the scriptures and to see the various ways that God has named and identified himself. We were discussing this week with, uh, I believe it was Russ or Craig or someone else, that uh, the, the name Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh means God, my provider. It's one of the names God has introduced himself as. But, but we've taken that, that name out of context. Jehovah Jireh is the name that God reveals himself when, I, when Abraham is about to kill Isaac, sacrifice him on an altar. And God gives another sacrifice and says, no, you're not supposed to sacrifice Isaac. I have another, uh, another sacrifice for you because I am Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. What does he provide? It's not about food, clothing, or anything else. It's about the provision for, for our sin. It's about a sacrifice that gives us a relationship with God. It's about his gift of Jesus Christ. That's Jehovah Jireh. And there's numerous other names of God. Do you know the names of God? Let me just share from for. Maybe not. Let, let me share with you from um, David Leggy. In a sermon that he preached called God Over All, he said, perhaps you're bereaved today. Do you know what his name is to you? I am the resurrection and the life. Perhaps as you sit, you're fearful of what the future might hold Perhaps you've got results of a test or you're worried about some disease that might rise its head up again. And he says to you as he said to John at his feet, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and ending. I know everything and everything is in my control. And if you're sick, he's the great physician. If you're a widow... He's the bridegroom and the husband of your heart. If you're fatherless, he is the everlasting father. If you're a sinner, he is the savior. If you're simple, read the book of Proverbs and you feel that you don't know enough and we find that he is the wisdom to man's head and man's heart. If you're needing guidance and you can't find the way, he's the wonderful counselor. If you're in the middle of turmoil, he is the prince of peace. He is the bread of if you're hungry, he is the bread of life. If you're at a dead-end street, he says, I am the door. And if you're wandering, and some of you are, he is the great shepherd. Do you know the name of God? In the psalm, he goes on to say that God is going to be with us. He's never going to leave us. Hebrews says it this way. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Why? Because the Lord is with me. Deuteronomy said it this way, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't matter what battlefield you're going on to. It doesn't matter what crisis, what conflict, what situation. The Lord says, I'll never leave you. And not only that, he also says, I will be a help to those who are weak. 2 Corinthians 12.10, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. strong. He goes on in chapter 13, verse 4. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, Jesus was. Yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him. Yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. Let's continue the psalm. By the way, at this point in the psalm, from, we've gone through now from verses 1 through 13. The first 13 are simply praise. They're thanks. They're things that, that they're reckoning on. God's with me. God's my refuge. God's my strength. God helps me. God's there by, beside me. And he's just praising God. But now, look what happens in the psalm. His praise leads him 
to prayer. Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. By the way, see if you can find praise in here too. See how my enemies persecute me? Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death that I may declare your praises in the gates of daughter Zion and there rejoice in your salvation. God, I've got enemies coming. Save me and rescue me so I can praise you some more. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his acts of justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. But God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. Arise, Lord, do not let mortals triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, Lord. Let the nations know that they are only mortal. <laughs> we need to know that too, don't we? His, David's praise leads him to prayer, and that prayer does what? Leads him back to praise. He says, Lord, I need you. Oh, Lord, I'm facing some enemies right now. Lord, I need you. Jesus said, come to me, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if you're weary, this is what the psalmist says. He says, I'm a stronghold for people who are weary. Come to me, and I will protect you. I will help you. I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. David says, Lord, I'm in need. You gotta, you gotta think about my trouble. You gotta think about what I'm going through. Consider my trouble. He says, look, the wicked, they're doing bad things, God. <clears throat> Adam Clark said, there's nothing that a wicked man does that is not against his own interest. He is continually doing himself harm and takes more pains to destroy his soul than the righteous man does to get his saved unto eternal life. This is a weighty truth. And with that, what does the psalmist say? Selah. Stop and take a breath. Meditate on that. Just stop and think. Pause everything. The wicked are ruining themselves. But the Lord Almighty is with you. The needy, he goes on to say, they will not be forgotten. God doesn't forget you when you're hurting and in need. He's there with you. And God just promises to carry you through your time of need. Praise will lift you out of that circumstance. That's the value of giving thanks in all circumstances because as you're giving thanks, you start to come out of the circumstance. You get away from your focus on that. Praise starts to comfort your soul. Praise reminds you there's more to life than even the worst of things I might be facing right now. And praise defeats the enemy and that includes the enemies of depression and shame. Find something to give God thanks for in the darkest moments you're facing. I'm amazed every time I go on to the scene where somebody has just died as, as chaplain with the fire department. Every time I get there, the people are broken and sometimes can't talk in deep anguish. Sometimes I will walk up and it's almost like, okay, well, because now, now you're not the firefighters, you're not the paramedic. And so I'll walk up and I'll give them that hug and they just start to sob. And maybe they've been holding it, on, holding it in up until that moment. And, 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 and it never fails, no matter what the situation, people always are thanking me afterwards. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us in, in this time of hurt and all. And, it's, and frankly, it's not me. But what I found is that thanks helps them. It's, uh, their, it's for their benefit, it's not for me. I mean, I, I, I'm still just hurting with them and hurting for them. But the thanks is something that starts to minister to them. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for caring. And there's so many times, I'm, I, I go into every one of those situations, oh Lord, I don't know how I'm gonna help, so just help me out. Lord, I, I don't know how I'm gonna deal with this. The, the suicide of a 12-year-old uh, just shot himself, the 16-year-old that hung, hung himself, oh Lord, I, I don't know how. The father that, that, that just um, died of cardiac arrest, I mean, it goes on and on and on. How do you help in those moments? Listen to what I said earlier. 
You don't go telling, oh, now I've got all these things to tell you. No, no, no. You just go in and you listen and you hug and you show the love of God because God is the refuge and strength. God is the holy comforter. God is the one who gives life. God is the one that's there for them. Let God just work. Let your praise lead you to prayer. And let your prayer lead you to praise. Let's pray. God, I can't help but look around the room and see people that I love and care about that I know are facing some tough stuff, have, been, have walked through the valley or have experienced the grief or going through a Thanksgiving without somebody that they've loved so much. Lord, there's people here that are facing um, medical issues, challenges. There's people here facing family issues. The, there's all the stress that all these students are facing, God. There's so much going on in lives. There's the, the challenges that we have with addictions and, and other fights that we're, that, that we're battling with spiritual powers of darkness. God, there's so much in the middle of all this. Teach us to give you thanks. to praise you because you are greater than it all. That, and like we said, all those different things, Lord, there are so many reasons we have to give you thanks in all circumstances. Remind us of that, God, when we're down. Just um, come alongside of us. I thank you, Lord, that we're never alone. I thank you, Lord, that you carry us through the darkest moments. I thank you, God, that you died to set us free and that you rose from the dead to give us eternal life and that one day we'll be free from all of the struggle, pain, difficulties, challenges, limitations, be reunited with people who have gone ahead of us and see them there in heaven because Jesus died for them and paved the way and opened the door and rose from the dead to give them life and us who believe too. I thank you, God, that this is not the end and that whatever we're facing, that whatever pain, whatever trial, whatever heartache, that you care, God, that you're there for us. I thank you that, that every person here doesn't have to face those moments alone. And I pray, God, that they would be more reminded of how much you love them. And if anyone here, God, is at that place where they don't believe in you, so therefore can't give you thanks and can't praise you, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. You'd help them to know you and believe that you are God. 